Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the latest of our academic webinars from the Institute of Economic Affairs and the Vincent Center, University of Buckingham, with me, Sai Kamal. I'm a professor of politics and international relations at St. Mary's University in Twickenham. I'm also the academic and research director at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Now, if you'll join us for the first time, the IEA is an educational charity. We were founded in 1955 to improve the understanding of the fundamental institutions of a free society. And we do this by analysing and explaining the role of markets in solving economic and social problems. Today we'll be looking at an interesting subject, whether uh, economics as a discipline undermines the case for state action or does it undermine the case for markets? Uh, as you know, economics as a discipline has been subject to a wave of criticism uh, for many years, but uh, particularly since the financial crisis of 2008. We see the Nobel winners, uh, Banerjee and Duflo, in their book, Good Economics for Hard Times. They exemplify this critique. They talk about, they defend good economics, but criticise what they see as an overblown defence of markets, which they believe has undermined the case for state action. Well, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Martin Ricketts, who's pro Emeritus Professor at the University of Buckingham, where the Vincent Centre is based. And he's also Chairman of the IA's Academic advisory council to discuss this. But before I introduce Martin, please allow me to talk you through the format for today. We are recording this webinar and the question and answer session to be rebroadcast later on our YouTube channel, IEA London. So please do bear that in mind. What we'll do is we'll start with a talk from Professor Ricketts. Uh, please feel free to submit questions during this presentation. Don't feel that you have to wait until the end. And if you prefer to remain anonymous, you can select this option in the Q&A function. Please do not use the chat function for questions, only use that to share relevant links or if you want to report a technical problem so we can see whether that's at your end or at our end. Now, after Martin's finished speaking, I will then formally move to the Q&A, but I'll also ask for your help. Um, even if you don't submit a question, please can you go to the Q&A function and help me by voting on the questions. That helps us if we have more questions and time allows, and I can call the most popular question in a very democratic way, um, if you like. If you're not sure where to find these two functions, move your cursor or your mouse to the bottom of the screen while you're in Zoom, and you'll see both a chat function and the Q&A function. So now to our speaker. Martin Ricketts is the Emeritus Professor at the University of Buckingham and is, and is Chairman of the IA's Academic Advisory Council. He gained his DPhil from the University of York and was a research economist at the Industrial Policy Group and a research fellow at the Institute of Social and Economic Research, the University of York. He joined the University of Buckingham um, and, be, and later became Dean of the School of Accounting, Business and Economics, and then the Dean of the School of the Humanities. He has published in professional journals on the new institutional economics, the theory of the firm, entrepreneurship, public choice, aspects of public finance and housing policy. And he's authored books on business, enterprise and ownership structure, and co-authored books on the economics of energy and government and industry. So with such a wide range of experience and disciplines, uh, who better that, uh, than Professor Ricketts to discuss this subject today? Martin, thank you very much for joining us today. We've been very keen to have you as a speaker on our webinar for some time. Delighted to, uh, that you can join us today. Let me hand the floor over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much for in inviting me, um, Said. I'll just have to see if I can make this um, system work. Um, I should be sharing my um, screen with you. Um, yes, I find myself in a, a slightly unfamiliar uh, situation, not only doing this, um, this Zoom presentation, uh, but um, uh, the topic really. Um, it, um, it, it, was, it, it really uh, arises out of something that um, Len Shackleton asked me to do um, a few months ago, simply a, a book review. Um, so normally I'd be expecting to do something more, more sort of specific and focused, but um, this is a book review um, uh, of, as you realize here, Banerjee and Dufflow. And um, he suggested that I, I, I sort of wrote a, a more extended um, reaction to it rather than simply confine myself to a few hundred words. Um, and so you can imagine the number of, of possible um, lines of investigation, if you like, of, of discussion. Um, but it, in order to sort of focus things, um, I thought it might be useful to um, not, not to set too many hairs running, although I sus suspect I will, because inevitably in a book uh, like 
Banerjee and Duffalo, is, you know, all sorts of policy areas are discussed from all sorts of points of view. But I was interested in the book in the end, in, in so far as it, it, it seemed to incorporate an attack on economics, really, and its, and its role, as they see it, in, um, in the present crisis, if you like. And again, I'll go into that in a few seconds. But the main themes, therefore, that I'm, I'm trying to focus on are um, the comparison, really, of economics as a rather formal discipline. And in that respect, this rational choice model, which is at the foundations of microeconomics, compared with a much more broad ranging um, study of political economy, which of course economics came out of, I suppose, around the sort of late 19th century, um, with its richer account of, uh, as I put it here, human motivations and, and institutional context. Um, and I also take the opportunity to compare um, Banerjee and Duffalo's indictment, if you like, of what they call bad economics, I'll come on to what that might mean in a second, uh, in their book, uh, with a much, much earlier uh, critique, which um, I read of classical, uh, a classical liberal critique of economics in, um, in, in, in the 1970s, when I was actually working for Alan Peacock um, he, um, as, a, as a research fellow. Uh, he produced this book with Charles Rowley, Welfare Economics, a Liberal Restatement, and it, 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 a lot of the themes came back as I was reading Bernard, uh, uh, Banerjee and Duffley. So that's the background. And that, I hope, will give you some, uh, some way of, 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 um, of, of uh, some sort of structure around which I'll be um, um, commenting. So, what, so first of all, the narrative. Well, it's, it's not an unusual narrative uh, now. I mean, they see, they see um, the world uh, as a set of problems now which are extremely serious. Um, I, I've, I've used their words, of course. I haven't given all the details of... Uh, of, of reference points and so forth, but um, hugely increased inequality, um, rising levels of, um, of uh, insecurity for a lot of people. They link that to um, um, technical change, but other things as well. Um, the banking crisis, obviously, 2008. Um, Environmental catastrophes. There's a uh, there's a, a whole chapter on on um, on the environment and so forth. Um, very important um, idea that growth has somehow um, come to a halt, or at least it's stalled. Um, and maybe most important of all for 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 Banerjee and Duffalo, they come at it from quite a, a sociological side. Really, they're very worried about fractured societies, they call it. Um, they see, I think probably, um, you know, the, the, the cultural changes that have come across over the last 20 years, you know, bigotry and hostility to immigrants, they, they say is, um, is, uh, has been exacerbated, if you like. Um, I don't want, really want to get into how true these propositions are. <laughs> I, mean, um, I mean, one could talk about those almost indefinitely, and I wouldn't be in a particularly good position um, to give a lot of detail about that. But what, what I wanted to focus on was their general conclusion, uh, which was the only possible way out involves a much expanded role for government. Um, and, um, you know, they, 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 they state this as a, as a kind of almost inevitable uh, consequence. Um, well, First of all, um, let, let me try and say a bit more about what they think of as bad economics, because actually uh, one, sh one has to bear in mind this book is not a book written for economists. And, and in a sense, it would be possibly a bit unfair to, 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 uh, uh, to look at it in quite that way. It's a polemic. Um, and it's written for the general public, I suppose, or the, or the, the intelligent labor and so forth. Um, and, um, but nevertheless, they seem to think that bad economics has played a part, really. And um, what do they mean by it? Well, the consequences of bad, e of bad economics, they seem to be fairly clear about. Exactly what they mean by it is less clear. Um, although I've, I've, tried to, um, I've tried to come to some kind of conclusion about that at the bottom. But, but the consequences are, as, as they see it, a sort of, bad economics as somehow 
fostering a, a, a blind assertion, a blinkered assertion, they call it, uh, that trade is good for everyone. Um, so there's a kind of ideological side to it, they feel, which, which supports uh, trade as something which everyone will benefit from. Um, they say that this economics overstates um, the cost of intervention, I suppose, in different ways, that if you want, um, if you want to tax people, they'll work less hard, they'll invest less, growth will suffer, the usual things. Well, they don't deny that there are these um, substitution effects and incentive effects, but they, they feel that um, bad economics are somehow exaggerated, overstated these effects. Um, that e economics is obsessed with GDP is the third thing, and um, uh, as a measure of, of, of welfare, and, they, and, and uh, uh, there's a, a kind of um, pursuit of excessive pursuit of growth objectives um, over, I suppose, um, things like you know environmental objectives, but also other social objectives, um, and finally, actually, selling the idea that the state is impotent and corrupt. Um, they feel that if you if you talk to an economist then or a bad economist. Um, they will have some preconceived about the idea about the state that um, you know it's 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 um, powerless and um, and um, a highly corrupt institution. Anyway, um, it's interesting that you know that those are the four. Um, and I don't think they're particularly unfair. I think I've I've, um, I've been reasonably straightforward in in in. I don't think I deny that that they're make, making these these connections between bad economics and these outcomes, and. They're associated with, I, I think they try to associate it with this rather formalistic approach to economic theory and this link that they, they seem to think that, that it has to this ideological focus on, um, on the free market. Um, I must admit, I looked at, the, at, at this list and, and it, it, it's almost a sort of, um, <laughs> um, um, it's a, 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 a personal accusation. I mean, I spent a lot of my life trying to uh, persuade people, you know, by and large, and in the very long run, trade is probably <laughs> good for everyone. And uh, that uh, there are efficiency growth, to, uh, efficiency costs to taxation and so forth. Um, I sit in graduate classes in the University of York, you know, and teaching out of Atkinson and Stieglitz without having some kind of personal <laughs> stake in the idea that, um, you know, there, there were, um, um, dead weight loss losses to, to to taxes and so forth. I don't suppose for a minute that um, Banerjee and Dufflew would necessarily uh, dissent from that. Obviously, but they're saying that somehow this is so excessive that it's it's misleading policy. I suppose. Um, as for the um, the last one, well, I mean, public choice theory is a, it was, in my view, a very great advance, and um, it's not clear to me at all whether they're, they're, they're attacking this theory or whether they're not. Um, but what about good economics then? Well, um, essentially, I, 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 they see it as really, and I quoted from here, from them here, a more expansive notion of what human beings want than is found in the standard theory of preference orderings. And I've just put my expl explanation there that in the standard theory, of course, these, these uh, economic agents are, uh, have have their preferences. They're given. Um, they're independent of others. They're um, they're complete and they're transitive and so forth. And people therefore can choose what is going to be, in their estimation, the best um, the best uh, um, item available. Um, but. Banerjee and Dufflow obviously em emphasize rather subtle differences. They say, well, you know, preferences aren't fixed. They're mutable. Um, they result from experience. They res they're, they're a result of social context and so forth. And that's, that's of course, widely said now um, and, uh, and accepted, but they emphasize that. And therefore, it does move away from the excessively formalistic economics. There's much greater importance of um, attached to institutional and, and, and social context. Uh, when it comes to the constraints, therefore, one is one is not just constrained by you know one's immediate technical possibilities, but whole lots of, of social networks and other forces. And they 
they like the idea of a method, um, which is uh, less like physics, if you like, and more like medicine. Uh, and they do actually talk about that a little bit, um, where um, any, any advice would require a certain amount of experience and, and guesswork and, 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 tr and really just, just trial and error um, testing. And uh, so there's a lot there which one could agree with. Um, and they, the requirements that, um, of this good economics you know, bear a close affinity to their work. I perhaps should have said that at the beginning. Their, 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 um, their professional work has been really in, in conducting randomized control trials in developing countries, looking at the way people do respond to policy interventions, things like um, subsidies on fertilizers, help for um, birth control measures, um, trying to get people to use uh, mosquito nets, you know, which are treated in some way, but this is, this is, this is costly, should you price them, should you not price them? Uh, you can guess the sort of prejudice that, that they would have, that, that um, economists uh, would, would want some kind of price attached, you know, <laughs> um, whereas um, it, it turns out, in their opinion, it's much better just to give them away. Um, well, um, I think all I, 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 one of the things I would note is that, of course, the, the characterization of economics as being unduly formal is all very well. But of course, over half a century, um, we've had moves which may, you know, well, it all depends on your, on your, um, on your interpretation, but, but we've had moves in, in the direction that um, Banerjee and Duff would have thought would have approved. Um, although I suspect they wouldn't approve of the first uh, um, thing on the list here, the Austrian school. Um, I mean, they, the, the, the questioning of, of the choice context and the, and, and the uncertainty and so forth, the information requirements has been emphasized from the very beginning um, um, for, uh, in the 40s and 50s by Shack, uh, Hayek and Shackle and people like that. Um, I, but I suspect if you ask them and they knew about it, they, they would say that uh, there was undue uh, support for the market coming from that particular school. I don't know. Then you've got evolutionary and behavioral economics, of course, which has come into its prominence very recently. Um, they do quote Kahneman and so on. and very sympathetic to that, as you can imagine, where, um, you know, the, 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 the kind of psychological um, um, experiments that have been done to show the certain inconsistencies and so on, especially when it comes to things like investment and uh, choice under, uh, uh, under risky situations. Um, I mean, th th they would uh, approve of that. Um, and the new institutional economics, well, th that's an area that I've, of course, spent a considerable time studying. Um, and you'd have thought that that would get a mention in, in, in Energy and Dufflo. And it, it, to my astonishment, I mean, Williamson and Coase just don't appear in the index at all, uh, any more than Hayek or Shackle, of course. Um, and um, so I, I'm not quite certain um, what um, they would say about it. Presumably, this, are these moves towards good economics? In my view, they're certainly moves towards uh, or trying to restore a sort of political economy approach to the subject rather than un undue formalism. But as I say, they don't get much credit um, when it comes to um, when it comes to Banerjee and Duffloo's book. Um, but I thought the interesting thing um, would be, or an interesting thing, would be to look at earlier critiques as well from a specifically classical liberal position. Um, um, because um, people like um, um, Charles Rowley and Alan Peacock always did, um, as part of their classical liberal critique, uh, take issue with the formalism of, um, of the, the, essentially the welfare economics out of which policy analysis tended to come in the 60s and 70s and so forth. Um, and this really went back to the rise of this notion of um, economic efficiency, which is absolutely at the center of, of policy analysis, um, and the so-called potential Pareto improvement as a sort of criterion for running public policy. I mean, economic efficiency, uh, for any um, 
students that are tuning in. I mean, it's just a situation really where there's no waste. Um, if you can make somebody better off without making somebody worse off, you're not efficient. Uh, if you can't rearrange things without harming someone, uh, you're efficient. Um, and so who wouldn't, in a sense, um, um, want to be at an efficient point uh, rather than, or some efficient point rather than an inefficient point. The problem is in, um, in getting from um, um, inefficiency to um, an efficient situation, because although it's potentially possible to do so with compensation, the gainers should be able to compensate the losers from a change. Um, of course, they may or may not actually be compensated. And um, the criticism of Peacock and Rowley was that that nuance, which is hardly a nuance really, it's absolutely fundamental, but, but nevertheless, um, in the rough and tumble of everyday life, it becomes a bit of a nuance, which can be easily overlooked. And so if you look at um, um, uh, Peacock and, uh, uh, Peacock and Rowley's um, book on a liberal restatement of welfare economics, what you find there they'll, they'll, they are um, trying to emphasize is agreement. Um, and and in, other, in other words, as I put it here, individual freedom. It, it's, it's not efficiency as such that's the important normative principle. I mean, you can have a lot of public efficient uh, officials trying to impose efficient <laughs> allocations of resources, but you wouldn't be in a liberal um, or classical liberal environment. A classical liberal environment requires people to make their own decisions and come to agreement. Um, you might, might anticipate that in so doing, you would move to greater levels of economic efficiency. It's sort of entrepreneurship argument associated with Israel Kirzner. But, but nevertheless, from the classical liberal position, it's not the final allocation that matters, it's the process. Um, and once these technical conditions for economic efficiency dominated um, policy, then you could argue that distributional effects were downplayed. Um, um, you know, essentially, as I put it here, anything that increased aggregate income would tend to be approved because then you could compensate any losers. Um, but this was opposed by classical liberals. I've given you a little quote here from, from uh, Alan, uh, Alan Peacock and, and uh, Charles Rowley. A it was a bold attempt to hoodwink the policymakers into believing that the Paratian criteria were more powerful than that was the case. In other words, they'd sort of, they'd, they'd forgotten that it, it, people needed to be compensated before you could really say that a Pareto improvement in welfare had, had occurred. Um, and of course, if, for anyone who's taught public policy, um, there, there was a very, um, there's a, a very much an awareness that, that really almost anything, any departure from efficiency, and they were manifest, you know, um, manifold, I beg your pardon, manifold examples of market, market failure everywhere, you know, monopoly externalities everywhere and so forth. Then the scope of government seemed to be almost unlimited and that uh, worried them. Well, okay, that's the background now. I, 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 I will try and be through by, uh, I'm not much over half an hour. I'm looking at my watch, so uh, another few minutes just to just to look at the individual things that um, Banerjee and Dufflu sort of um, uh, highlighted. Um, this this argument that inter, in, that somehow international trade um, uh, uh, standard economics um, led to the argument that, that, that international trade was somehow good for everyone. Well, that seems odd to me. I mean, it, 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 obviously they're talking, I suppose, about um, the way it's inter economics is interpreted in the media or something. But, but it seems to me that, that um, from the very beginning, the, 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 the arguments for free trade have always paid attention to the distributional consequences. Um, so even with the basic 20, early 20th century Hector O'Lee model, everyone knew that, that um, um, with specialization, um, different groups would gain and, and others would lose. It's just that um, the gainers would be able, in principle, to compensate the losers. And of course, uh, the complaint is that very little attention has been paid to the actual compensation. Whether that's true or not, again, um, you know, one could leave to discussion and so forth. But that's the assertion. Um, 
but you know, if, if you look back in the literature, someone like Gottfried Haveler, I, I have a copy of his book here, and um, it, it interested me but from Vienna School. Um, um, clearly, in, in not make any bones about it, that that um, that uh, um, a higher national income uh, might come about as a uh, as a result of free trade, but it could lead to distribution of income regarded on some ground or other as undesirable. And he looked at all sorts of grounds that might be undesirable. Um, but of course, the losses and the, 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 the amount of, of disruption will depend upon on the uh, occupational and geographical mobility of resources. Um, and there, of course, in true Keynesian style, um, Banerjee and Duff who emphasize on the whole, a very sticky world in which this doesn't happen, or certainly doesn't very happen, happen very quickly. Um, and um, that seems to me a fair enough observation. But again, classical liberals have recognized this over the, um, over the years. Um, I mean, if one looks um, at um, even at Adam Smith, I mean, you would find um, quotes um, easily where he's saying, well, you know, some circumspection uh, should. Uh, uh, should characterize introduction of, of, of moves towards free trade, especially when people have sunk a lot of capital in particular areas or you've got very large numbers of people dependent on particular things. You know, wisdom would suggest going rather slowly and so on. But on the other hand, in the very long run, uh, it certainly will uh, lead to um, better circumstances. Um, and um, he doesn't let that get in the way of the overall you know, policy as being beneficial. Um, how about taxation and welfare? Um, you know, again, um, uh, the, the assertion is that the poorest haven't haven't benefited much from um, from uh, recent uh, growth or since about 1980. In fact, um, um, I know we had a webinar quite recently given by Martin Agarup, I think, in which he was disputing some of the interpretation of the, of the statistics that one, or the data that, that one comes across. This is quite specific. In, if we look at uh, Banerjee and Duffu's um, uh, presentation, I mean, they are looking at particular people, well, not particular people, but a, a very specific group, high school dropouts in the US. Um, so um, um, whether if Martin Agarup did a longitudinal study of high school, <laughs> high school dropouts in the US, um, they're better off now um, than they would have been in 1980, who knows? But um, um, nevertheless, that's as we saw the story. Um, and they argue that, that actually the, the obsession, the, 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 the tax cuts, if you like, to the very richest groups um, have been advocated on uh, on false grounds, really, that um, that the the disincentive effects would would have vastly exaggerated. And if you look, you find that really what what they're noticing here, what they're trying to assert here, is that a lot of very high incomes um, are really in, come in the form of rent. Um, so he talks about, or they talk about, the development of you know globalized markets and so forth. Um, as um, resulting in sort of win winner-takes-all situations where you then get the potential for very, very large rents. Um, you think of special talent like footballers and so forth with their, their rewards going up uh, extre extremely rapidly because of, of the, the greater and greater international market and so forth. And, but my point here would be, yes, maybe, maybe not, but... Um, the whole idea of rent taxes is really a, a very um, important topic in classical liberal debates going back into the 19th century. This is, this is really um, a question of political economy. Um, you know, it was never any doubt that uh, rent uh, in those days, of course, almost entirely focused on land, um, that um, rent taxes were from a purely economical point of view, as Mill might have said, um, um, uh, if, uh, less disruptive than other taxes, but uh, well, less uh, ha having lower efficiency costs um, than other taxes. Um, 
but um, someone like John Stuart Mill would still object uh, on political economy grounds, you know, that, well, yes, but you're, 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 you're dealing with a particular class of people. Now, we would have to, with the, the concept of rent extending, um, to include certain aspects of human capital and, and, uh, and uh, so forth, there would be all sorts of ethical questions, and indeed they are discussed in the literature. Um, but these are questions of political economy, not of, of economics. On, on the welfare side, it's interesting that they, um, they looked at um, the negative income tax uh, tradition. I was particularly interested in that because Alan Peacock um, was always a supporter of, of that in principle, I think, uh, going back to his work uh, with, um, uh, with, uh, on a, com a committee of inquiry in into it just after the Second World War. Um, anyway, um, uh, it, another in an interesting point about that is that a classical liberal like Alan Peacock or Milton Friedman are supporting uh, distributions if you like, through a, a negative income tax system on the grounds that it maintains autonomy then. You, you, it's, it's fairly automatic. People then can decide what to spend their income on. They can, um, uh, that you're not being, um, you know, so intrusive in their affairs, not forcing them to do one thing or another. Um, but interestingly, um, uh, Banerjee and Dufflu actually oppose um, the negative income tax solution, or they say that that, that kind of, thing wouldn't be good in the context, say, of the United States, developed economies, because, again, political economy. Um, they feel that just simply giving people automatically, in a sense, uh, resources to get cash is kind of, um, would, be, would, be, um, would be interpreted as just kind of, writing, kind of writing them off, not really getting to the root of the problem. Somehow, it, it would just allow people to sit around, I suppose, being alienated. They want to get to the roots of this alienation and do something about it. Um, and that therefore, simply using it as a way of sloughing off, you know, uh, investigations into, into these other social conditions would be wrong. Now, I need to get on and finish here. I, I, um, just, a, uh, there's too much, uh, too much stuff on there, but essentially, um, my, my interest there was in the accusation that economics is obsessed with GDP. And my point is that, again, for classical liberals, that is simply not true. Um, so, um, um, if, if, if the, the, um, um, the uh, classical, I mean, people like John Jukes, um, uh, who wrote a book called Ordeal by Planning in the, uh, in the, just after the Second World War, um, and for whom I worked for a few years. Um, actually, um, in, his, in his book, Ordeal by Planning, he, he has a chapter on the moral sickness of a planned society. And his view was that it's, it, it was the absence of markets that left to this, <laughs> led to this, this obsession with, with, um, with GDP. Um, that it's the planners who were who couldn't couldn't get away from thinking about you know trying to increase GDP everywhere. And it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a claim that he would necessarily make for a market economy. The market economy simply permitted people to make what choices they wished. No one ever claim, need claim, he says, the, the first aim of an individual or community is to become rich. Um, I even uh, rather mischievously go back to John Stuart Mill. It's only in the backward countries, he says. This is about, this is about 18, I suppose about 18. I'm not quite sure. It's a sixth edition, so I'm not quite sure how late that was. But anyway, probably in the 1870s, 80s, I could write that it, it's only in the backward countries of the world that increased production is still an important object, <laughs> um, which seemed to me to be going a bit far. Um, well, again, I, I def I, I, um, on the view of the state, um, the idea that somehow there's this background of economist-inspired chatter about waste in government <laughs> seems to me to write off public choice theory in a way. Um, um, and um, it, um, it, 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 they make the point that, you know, you, you can't just say, well, the, the, the government is no good, therefore we have to leave it to the market. But of course, we've always <laughs> worked from the other way around. You can't say that, well, because there are these problems with the market, we should leave it all to the government. Um, there needs to be some kind of agreement that actually what you want, of course, is a comparative institutional analysis. And actually, you'll look in vain for it in uh, their book, at least 
on government. I mean, they're, they're obviously brilliant when it comes to institutional detail at the microeconomic level in developing developing countries and so forth, and how, how institutions can affect people there. But they don't really want to bother about looking at how the state is organized. They recognize that it's, it's, it's um, a highly imperfect institution, but they're so overwhelmed by the present crisis, as they see it, that, um, you know, they, um, that they just have, in a sense, given up. As I put it here, the assertion that more government in the third, the third, um, the third, uh, sentence down the assertion that more government is the only way to respond to modern problems sounds more like panic than the outcome of comparative institutional analysis i'm pretty sure that that's the case they don't really make a, a, a strong case they just say there is no alternative um so my it, it's just a background on on really the state of economics and people's attitude to economics and and i think my my point is i i, I certainly don't see formal economics as being a necessarily a great supporter of market processes. I don't think historically it has been. Um, I think that liberal, uh, the liberal criticism, the criticism come, coming from the sort of classical liberal wing have certainly um, uh, buttressed the idea that markets uh, are to be preferred generally if possible over other, other um, um, uh, allocation devices. But, but even there, um, classical liberal political economists have always been quite sophisticated about the range of institutions um, that would evolve un under a free system. But I'd better stop there, I think. I'm sorry, I've gone far too. I've, got, I've only got 25 minutes, so um, I, I apologise for going over, over, over time. Well, Martin, thank you very much. If I could just ask you to unshare your screen. I would indeed. Um, stop share. Yeah, exactly. But thank you very much. That's a a number of uh, fascinating points to get us started. Um, I also was very interested in the work of Energy and Duflo. I saw, you know, we've been doing some work at the IA, a project, a work, a work in title is a welfare beyond the state um, mm -hmm. and how we help the, uh, the very poor at the micro level. And there was some interesting conclusions there. I wonder if I could, uh, can I encourage the viewers now to submit their questions? Uh, please you know, feel free to submit questions. And Martin, maybe if there are some points that you were, were unable to make in your presentation, you could work them into the answers to some of the questions. Sure. Yeah. Can I just ask, let me, let me start off by asking you a question in terms of, are we not just becoming a, are we not just being a little bit hypersensitive as classical liberals? And what I mean by this is that we would criticize uh, those who see economics as dominated by the, the, the principles that we advocate, free markets, et cetera. But the consensus on most people out there, um, you know, when they look at economics is, I mean, I, I look at a lot of textbooks, they talk about the, le the neoliberal consensus right. in economics, for example. Yeah. So yeah. an awful lot of neutral people, um, and obviously people from the left, would see as some of the principles that we believe in have dominated economics, even while we would probably say, yes, but it hasn't gone far enough. It doesn't really understand market economics well. You know, you've got this perfect model, you've got this model of perfect competition, um, and then you adapt it for oligopolistic competition, et cetera. But really, that's not how markets work. Markets work as a, you know, aggregation of all the microtransactions that go on between willing buyers and sellers. And isn't that what Deflo and Banerjee are really saying when they look well, at the micro? Well, I have some sympathy with that. This is why I tried to phrase my sort of review article in, in, a, in a way which, which, well, I tried not to be overly hostile in a sense. I, <laughs> um, in fact, to be, uh, it, 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 they're actually quite disarming, as I, I, I say, if you look at the review article as a whole, they're very disarming about things. I mean, they, they say, well, you might not agree with <laughs> everything that we're writing or any of it. Um, and, um, it, it but um, they, I think, are rather despairing, perhaps, of the, the lack of, of, of any kind of attempt at some kind of consensus. So um, my um, efforts was, wasn't really intended to, to try to be totally destructive I, it wasn't that I thought there was the enemy and they needed to be they need to be destroyed far from it um, in fact that was really the point that I was kind of looking at their critique and trying to uh, try to see where it linked with the sort of criticisms we had of, of uh, you know of the, of the standard approach of economics if you like and um, I mean I, I I've spent it, it just it just struck me that nevertheless that that the idea that 
economics as a discipline is somehow um, highly supportive of, well, destructive of government intervention generally and su totally supportive of market processes, has struck me as someone who's taught public policy for quite a few years, you know, um, um, a, a curious proposition because actually, as, as Peacock and Rowley were, were complaining about, um, the essential intellectual structure can lead to a highly interventionist state. And um, um, uh, it, it seemed to me that, um, you know, just as, you know, you may be right that, that um, one can be oversensitive to these things, but um, it seemed to me that, that, that uh, Banerjee and Duffalo were sort of uh, underestimating um, the, the power of these, these, um, of, of these uh, propositions, efficiency propositions, you know, the efficiency of, of, of competitive markets and so on, um, which they think then lead people to be very uncritical about competitive markets. Well, I haven't noticed that. I mean, indeed, um, the very efficiency theorems lead people to say, well, it's crazy because no situation is anything like this. Therefore, the government got to come in and sort it out. Um, so, um, you know, the, 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 having spent a sort of uh, quite a few years um, looking at this tendency of the government to extend its remit into just about every area on grounds of market failure, essentially, um, it struck me as being very odd to think of, of the standard model as being something that, 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 that inhibits this uh, extension of, of, of government action. Okay, well, I've got quite a few questions, but I think we should turn to the Q&A. And if I can encourage uh, viewers, participants to submit their questions in the Q&A, don't be shy. Uh, if, you're, if you are shy, you can submit it anonymously. Um, so next question is from Adam Bartha from the Epicenter and the IEA. He says, do you believe that Deflo and Banerjee were motivated to form their theory based on empirical evidence from the public policy world instead of an a priori, a priori uh, disagreement with classical liberal theory? If so, maybe the issue is that a lot of corporatist public policy decisions in the last decades were described as neoliberal, classical liberal, even though they weren't. Um, I think that's a, a, a very good point. I think, um, um, I, I mean, obviously I can't talk about the motivation of, of uh, of uh, Banerjee and Dyfle, right? um, uh, but uh, there, I think there is, is, is some justice in that, that, that um, I think if you look at their work, you know, they, they, it, it's the fact that they've been so active in developing countries and um, they, they feel that um, even very corrupt government, for example, can be better than what <laughs> what is there now I, I i i i don't necessarily disagree <laughs> disagree with that um i mean if you're doing comparative institute institutional analysis you have to take you know the circumstances on the ground very much into account and they are particularly aware of those circumstances so i think they 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 look at the um the results of of um of policy maybe in a slightly different way i mean they, they they're they're perfectly prepared to say there's a great deal of waste and so forth but um, even an incompetent government here is better than no action at all um, you and I might say well I don't know there are all sorts of other things we might encourage you know um, other institutions um, we might to, to develop I'm mean, not business ones of course but also uh, cooperatives non <laughs> who knows what institutional um, arrangements you might get to to improve conditions. You know, thinks, one thinks of Eleanor Ostrom, who actually gets one mention in uh, in, in in the book. She does get a mention, um, but um, you know, you think of that. Um, all this is 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 possible, but you see their point. If you spent really decades studying extremely poor people in developing countries, um, I think probably intuitively, because I, I haven't done that, intuitively though I can, I think I could understand that they would come out a little bit more optimistic about what a government might achieve, even, even quite a corrupt one, you see what I mean? So they get irritated with, with, with the with those of us on the other side who are always sort of in, insisting that, well, you know, there's a lot of waste here, shouldn't we look at other alternatives? Yes, I suppose I can empathise with that because I've, I've done a lot of work at, uh, looking at poor communities in London and solutions to poverty uh, in, in London and 
and in the UK. And when you start to talk to people in many of these communities and, and organizations, you do realize they do, they do have challenges for us yeah. you know, in, in terms of free yeah. markets. Um, and I, I think you, you alluded to that in terms of compensation earlier on. Yeah. You know, we talk about free trade. We talk about the fact that, um, that you know, we, we accept the fact that there are, uh, in, in the short term, uh, concentrated losses, distributed gains. Right. But we, but we don't necessarily propose solutions for those short term adjustments and losses. Um, and I, if I wonder if I give you another example. If you think about um, in this country, the beaching railway cuts, for example, part of the economic uh, arguments behind them was for, for some rural railways, it was cheaper to pay everyone to go on a taxi right. rather than keep the train going. Mm. But when the rail lines go, went, people, you know, the government or someone else didn't pay for people to use the taxis. So, that, yeah. they, so they felt, well, hold on, we lost. So <laughs> how, how do we as people who believe in free markets or classical liberals, you know, address those uh, concerns when we are basing decisions based on economic decisions. Yeah, I, I, well, I think that's that's exactly right. And uh, but that's what political eco a, a sort of classical liberal political economy would do. And I, you know, in a way, um, of course, if you're at, at the IEA, you you tend to be looking at ways that you know markets can improve the uh, the, 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 the the people's lives and the allocation of resources and so forth. Um, but um, you know, I suppose what I'm saying is that in, in, in the traditions of political economy going back into the 18th century, I mean, there would be no question that that sort of transitional issue would be um, considered. As I, I mentioned earlier, you know, Adam Smith was very kind of clear about that, actually. Um, of course, he didn't go m into m much detail. I suppose, what, there's about three pages. I, I, looked in, I looked up the reference last night as a matter of interest. And... Um, you know, it, 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 he doesn't then exactly tell you, well, OK, how long would, would, would the transition take and what kind of mechanism would you need? I mean, um, Banerjee and Dufflu recommend actually flex security. I didn't actually, uh, it was on the slide, but I didn't, or one of the slides, but I, I didn't go into that. But um, at least they're, they're, in a sense, classically liberal, um, uh, liberally orientated there. They're not actually recommending that people should be, you know, that one, one should fix people in, in a particular position and, and, and inhibit movement or anything like that. Um, although they do speculate about um, subsidizing firms so long as they employ rather old labor. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought they, they mentioned a few practical difficulties. Well, they didn't mention particular practical difficulties. They, they did admit that there might be practical difficulties. Um, I thought that was probably, I mean, but just intuitively, that might not be a very sensible way of going. But, but nevertheless, we could get the point that they're, they're concentrating on the essential issue, that very old, older workers uh, will be less flexible, perhaps more tied in to particular local areas and so forth. Maybe for very specific lengths of time, one might consider such a thing. But at least it, it's something that, that classical liberal and broadly free market economists shouldn't just, certainly shouldn't be saying, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> I've already said that I, I, I'd be surprised if it turned out to be the best policy. It might be others better ones. Although I must admit, I, I, you know, who can say? Um, but that is a kind of conversation which is perfectly reasonable, it seems to me. Yeah, and, and it is. If I could just encourage uh, viewers, uh, uh, participants to submit questions, please do carry on uh, submitting questions. Uh, Martin, just continuing on what you just said there, were there elements of what you read in um, Banerjee to Flow that you thought, they've got a point here, and uh, how do we respond as classical liberals to that, or how do we address, um, uh, reposition our arguments or our, our arguments to the point they're making? Were there, so, uh, were there examples of that as you read that? Well, I suppose the, in one sense, I suppose I felt the whole book was a bit like that. I mean, <laughs> when I when I put up those examples of bad economics um, at the beginning, you know, uh, the, the, uh, I, I, I suppose in a way, I um, I was I was trying to say, well. Um, They've got a point here. You see what I mean? I, 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 I over say international trade. You know, um, well, um, I, I like to think I haven't spent my career saying it was, it, it was all, always going to be. You know, they're going to be no losers in this. Um, um, I mean, there are all sorts of 
reasons why I support free trade. And, and it's certainly true that in the long run and for all sorts of other, not just economic, but, but uh, ethical and um, um, reasons and, and, and social reasons, um, you know, one, what, what, what one is supportive of that. But it, it's, it's, um, it seemed to me that, okay, they did, they did have a point that um, when I think about the way some, um, some you know, people have written about it, maybe they haven't been that careful. And in fact, as I was said later, it fitted into a whole <clears throat> neoclass, uh, sorry, and, um, uh, uh, classical liberal, um, you know, cr critique of, of, of standard economics. Um, the, whole, the, the whole notion that, um, um, you know, that, that, um, that, that maybe taxes um, we could think in terms of, 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 say, taxing rent more. I mean, have classical liberals really considered that? Uh, they don't actually, to be fair, I, I need to be clear here, they don't make a huge matter of the rent tax. They're not like my colleague um, uh, Nick Tiedemann, a VPI, a noted Georgist, who has spent you know, his life, uh, his, I mean, his professional life um, uh, supporting the kind of Georgist tradition, um, um, but um, but nevertheless, tax you know that 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 question about uh, say that the the, um, uh, the efficiency properties, but also the ethics of um, of taxing the rent from resources, uh, is an absolutely classical uh, political economy question. And and you say, well, yes, maybe we haven't given that much attention. I mean, I don't suppose the IEA has done much on. On that, it may, it may have done in its in the past, and so forth. And there are there are strong arguments on various sides. You know, the, the, I think the trouble, the thing about ordinary, um, how can I put it, um, the, the kind of economics that is formalistic is that it, it does. It, it, one of the reasons that it, it it has traction, of course, is it often produces answers, <laughs> and. You know, they're, they're very, it's very attractive as a social scientist um, to feel that, you know, there are theorems here and they produce these results. This is the sort of physics element coming in. And, and I suppose a number of economists felt that it gave them a certain advantage against other social scientists, you know, who didn't have that, that kind of white coated look. Um, uh, I think that's very, very bad for economists, personally. I think we should have much more classical liberal and, and um, much more um, uh, wide-ranging sort of uh, set of, 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 um, uh, of, of considerations, not just, e you know, economics ones. I think at the very end of, I think I, at the very end of, of the slide, the last slide, which I didn't have time to talk about in detail, there's a quote from John Stuart Mill, you know, saying there's almost no public policy area you can think of where he says purely economic calculations will give you a kind of answer. It, is, it always involves a whole range of issues. And I took it that by that, he probably did mean what we mean by calculation and rash, just simple rational decision uh, on the basis of, of sort of not wasting resources or something. Okay, Martin, well, we've got a couple of minutes. I want to finish just before two. I've, uh, yeah. um, so um, I've got a question. Um, so I wonder if you've got time for two questions. The first one from Elaine Sternberg. Elaine, thank you very much for joining us from the east coast of the United States. We really appreciate the fact you tune in regularly. Um, Elaine says, many, perhaps most, who teach in business schools in the US and the UK are anti-capitalist mm -hmm. and indeed anti-business insofar as business is the activity of maximizing long-term owner value. Are many non-Austrian academic economists against free markets? And if so, what is the core of their argument? Right. Um, well, hello, <laughs> Lane. <laughs> um, um, I'm not sure I can, I can answer the last bit of your question. I, can, I, I, I think um, it, it, it's, it, it's probably true that in business schools, in spite of, in spite of actually going off to work in business, um, the um you know the, the the faculty tend to be quite um quite critical i suppose or at least they they haven't they don't seem to show much enthusiasm for the moral case for business i mean they're sort of so overwhelmed by 
the I suppose by the criticisms or something that they they they, they have perhaps surrendered that and and I know Elaine is is, is busy uh, trying to do something about that making the the, the case for um, you know the 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 the, the, the moral uh, the moral case which I I do think needs repeating. Uh, very often. I mean, I, it, it certainly, it, I think people are persuaded by moral arguments as much as purely technical ones. I mean, I, I quoted that Duke's thing at, a few minutes ago, didn't I, while I was talking, I think um, uh, the moral, um, you know, the, the, the Duke's chapter on, on, on the, um, uh, the, the planned economy and, and uh, um, how morally it, it, uh, it left a lot to be desired. And as a, as a young person reading that for the first time, I mean, I think I, I'd still look back on that. That's why I can still quote it. I, that was a sort of transformative moment when I read that chapter and some of those quotes. I, I, I suddenly could understand the moral case <laughs> or free markets, you know, that I hadn't entirely put together, you know. Um, and um, uh, and it, it became very much clearer. Um, and um, so as for the, the, the question of, well, what about, what about economists themselves? I don't know, I think if Pat Minford were looking in, he's probably not, but uh, he would say that I would be exaggerating if, 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 if I said a lot of e e economists as such were, um, were sort of critical of, 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 of markets, uh, academic economists. Um, uh, I'm not so, so sure, and as I said, I think that the, the problem is that, that their jobs are in government and, they're, they're, um, and, and in academia, and, and they, if they're teaching out of the same textbooks as I teach from in, in public policy, there are all these arguments for government intervention that you have to exactly. somehow counter one after the other and continually. Yeah, that reminds me of a, a, an anecdote I was once asked, uh, which economy had more economists than any other? And after a sort of round of uh, uh, guesses, the answer was the Soviet Union. And look how that turned out. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so um, last question from Rachel Tingle. Uh, Rachel, thank you very oh, much for joining Rachel. us. Yes. Um, I, she, uh, Rachel says, I don't understand why they are against the negative income tax. What would be their view about traditional welfare support systems? What would be their view about traditional welfare support systems traditional welfare. oh um well it, yes i i i i, I think they're they're highly critical um um but the the, the the i the reason they um i mean in one sense i if it, you've got to remember this isn't a book about about it doesn't go into detail it tends to be discussing a rather wider area and then suddenly it will mention something like you know the negative income tax tradition it's not as if there's a chapter on the negative income tax and the uh, uh and the, the, the guaranteed income and so forth but um to to answer the, the the first point um i probably didn't make it very clear maybe it's because you know i don't have a great handle on it myself but the, the i think the point is they they see the individual as needing more than simply money you know they're they're, they're, yeah. they're in a, an, a social context and if they're in certain types of social context simply giving them money <laughs> will not solve the problem um, they'd rather a sort of flex security system which actually encouraged them perhaps to go 100 miles from their support network for all i know and uh, and and look for a job somewhere else i'm not sure uh, that that's quite right but you see what i mean that they are just noting that there are social norms, situations that people get into, which are which kind of fix them. Yes, and so they say they say something like, you know, just, just, we should reduce the poor to just cartoon characters. Just giving them more money doesn't solve the problem. Doesn't really and, solve the problem. And, and they uh, actually look at different ways of spending. In some countries, villages with the same amount of money spent relatively more on festivals. In other countries, they spent money on TVs, for example, yes, as opposed yes, to food. And he was looking at social norms that way, weren't they? That's yeah, I mean, they do say, actually, that they, they, they're not disagreeing that people on the whole use money wisely. I mean, they, they defend people who buy satellite TV rather than food. <laughs> so, yes, well, you know, it's quite exactly. interesting. Um, they say, no, you look at the detail, and they're making perfectly rational decisions. But it doesn't alter the fact, I think, that they see the crisis in the United States in particular. This is, this is you've got to remember they're saying, it's not right for the United States. Weirdly, the guaranteed income idea is sort of something they play around with more supportively with respect to 
developing countries where it might they think perhaps be more affordable and you're dealing with people with you know with very few resources indeed um but i think they think just it looks as if you're just giving people money to go away and stop complaining or that they don't seem there doesn't seem to be enough um <laughs> in the way of sort of um uh support to to kind of change their lives, I suppose. It's yeah. a sociological point. I mean, it's one that I'm not equipped to answer, particularly especially as an economist. Um, but it, 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 it seemed to me to be interesting because you had the classical liberal political economy idea that this was, this was going to be good. It, it, it supported autonomy, and yeah. that's very important. Um, and uh, on the other hand, you've got uh, Banerjee and Duffalo saying, well, yes, it's not, it's somehow not good enough. So they're, they're sort of downplaying the importance of autonomy, as I really point out in the, in the, um, in the review article. I mean, a classical liberal will be disappointed that they don't see to really recognize the sort of long term, A, importance of, of individual autonomy and the, the necessity of people to make their own decisions. Um, uh, but you know they, they 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 kind of have 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 sort of given I suppose they they've given up on that in in, in a way you know or, or, but they all, they also don't seem to have much feel for for long run competitive the, the, the pressure I mean they don't really make a lot of the importance of competition I mean having said that the, that that's all that economists can think about I suppose <laughs> they're not inclined really to support it but of course from an Austrian point of view it's what does all the work exactly well, on that note I, yeah. I'm going to have to end it there Martin thank you very much for joining us really appreciate it um, as I said I've been trying to get you to speak for us for a long time so really pleased you could do that today can I thank all the participants and viewers for joining us today hope you found it as fascinating as I did please remember we have a regular schedule of online content uh, during lockdown and updating content every day um, if you're a classically liberal minded PhD student and you'd like to know more about our program of seminars with the Vincent Center University of Buckingham please get in touch so for more details of all our content please visit our website ia.org.uk check out our YouTube channel IA London listen to our podcast on Podbean and finally a small request to help us keep providing free content during these tough times please do consider making a contribution no matter how modest by donating online at ia.org.uk thank you for watching or listening again today uh, we hope that you'll be able to join us again soon. Stay safe in the meantime, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. And thank you, Martin. <laughs>